the courthouse. People who couldn't make it. Um, I'm your colloquium czar, Abe Stone. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, James Garrison of Baldwin Wallace University. Um, Professor Garrison has a really unusual and to me really fascinating both educational history and combination of interests. Um, although I think actually maybe to call it combination of interests is a little bit wrong because as I hope will be obvious from his talk today, these things that um, people tend to consider really disparate are actually drawn together into his work to a single point. Um, so uh, he, I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit of his educational history because it's so interesting. He began his graduate studies at the University of Hawaii, which is a department that's obviously well known for its expertise in Asian philosophy and comparative philosophy. Um, and he worked there with Roger Ames, who's now at Peking University, among other things on Confucian thought. And he also spent a significant amount of time in China perfecting his Chinese. So he's actually, he's a really uh, unfortunately rare thing among us, uh, someone to whom that whole Chinese tradition is an open book. Um, but then in fact, he ended up getting a graduate fellowship at the University of Vienna and he actually finished his PhD there. And his interest in German language philosophy um, especially near and dear to some of us in this department, Kantian aesthetics also goes way back. And in fact, I see that as long as 2011, he published a paper titled Kant's Aesthetic Judgment on the Progress of Peace, <laughs> which uh, I probably should read. This is kind of, a, you know, of introducing speakers, things they've written that I probably should read. Um, and uh, also not so surprisingly, uh, but even more unusually, he works on recent Chinese Kantian slash Marxist slash Confucian philosophy, which I believe will figure also in today's talk. And all of that is just scratching the surface. I haven't even mentioned uh, Emerson or Nietzsche or obviously critical theory. Um, today's talk is going to be, first of all, a response to Judith Butler. Um, and he's published uh, any number of fascinating things on all these topics, but his talk today is based on a forthcoming book. It's going to be published by SUNY Press early next year of, I take it, the same exact title as the talk. And the title, that title is namely, Reconsidering the Life of Power, Ritual, Body, and Art in Critical Theory and Chinese Philosophy. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, James Garrison. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Professor Stone. Uh, before I, oh, can you hear me and see me okay? Hello? Okay. Uh, before I begin, and uh, while we're setting up my screen share, uh, let me just say a few words uh, off script. Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining, those of you uh, who have taken the time uh, to come here. Um, I'm not going to lie that I am, uh, I'm not at my best right now. I worked a 15-hour shift on election day at my local uh, polling precinct and uh, spent yesterday recovering and uh, while well also uh, do doom scrolling and stress eating. So I'm kind of like a crack house lab right now. So I'm going to stay largely on script uh, right now where the script is uh, coming from the introduction to my forthcoming book. Um, this is just so I don't meander too far uh, since uh, I am, as I said, not quite at my best. Uh, let's see how we're doing on that screen share. I don't see the option as of yet. Uh, so uh, to draw this out just a little bit longer, um, I'll also say, uh, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Um, I'll also say that I have a couple other projects coming out uh, that I want to flog uh, for, uh, for publicity purposes. I have a project coming out with Rutledge uh, that I'm a co-editor on and also a contributing author. Uh, called uh, Political uh, Philosophy um, from an inter Intercultural Perspective. And um, this will have a, a bunch of essays looking at uh, different issues from um, around the world um, with a contemporary continental focus. And yeah, I'm sorry. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, I got the screen share up now. Okay, great. Um, 
And then uh, the other project that I have underway um, is also related to Judith Butler, but in a very different direction, uh, working on, um, working from rather, uh, Butler's Bodies That Matter. Uh, I'm uh, writing a book for Lexington, uh, books called uh, Black Bodies That Matter. So uh, the meaning of which should I uh, think be fairly obvious. So uh, looking at the politics of mourning and what have you. Uh, with that said, let's get into this foray into uh, Butlerian thinking. Uh, here looking at uh, her general framework for ritual performativity and trying to extend that with the, um, the insights from East Asian philosophy, classical and contemporary on ritual uh, in, uh, in, in social life. Okay, so let's get this going here and okay. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Now we're going to look at the piece that. Oh, soup. Sorry. Uh, and let's try this again. Okay, everybody can see everything correctly, I presume. Okay, great. So um, here I have a, a series of figures that will be um, at play here. Uh, we have Michel Foucault, um, uh, Confucius, Richard Schusterman. Bernard Stiegler, whom I'll only just glancingly touch on in this presentation, uh, Li Zeho, uh, the, the person who's the on entry point into Kantian, Confucian, and Marxian thinking, and Judith Butler. Uh, it's a little bit of a strange combination, but I hope that you'll enjoy the journey. So um, here I'm going to adopt my Foucault rotten dramatic pose. Now, our main question, and I'll uh, give it a little bit of dramatic reading here. Um, I have this quote that I like to open with, uh, that I'm not sharing on the screen. Uh, Foucault, at, at a key point in Discipline and Punish, says, it must cease forever, describing the effects of power in negative terms. It excludes, it represses, it suppresses, it censors, it abstracts, it masks, it conceals. In fact, power produces, it produces reality. It produces domains of objects and rituals of truth, end quote. So, um, what I want to say here is that the, the task of accounting for how persons, how subjects are made, brings a convergence between what Euro-American traditions tend to deem to be the separate domains of ethics and aesthetics. It is in this regard that alternative voices, particularly those from East Asia, and even more particularly from the Confucian tradition, possess a distinct advantage. Having had such a long history in which to develop on uh, its own terms, Confucianism can address the conjunctions of ethics, aesthetics, and politics that occur in person making uh, in ways that um, the best, though still ultimately tradition bound and reactive efforts uh, from Euro American critical theory cannot. Here, the path is sixfold. Going through, uh, in this project, the path is sixfold. Going through uh, the critical post structuralist notion of becoming subject, subjectivation, and the accompanying idea of autonomy alongside the classical Confucian idea of ritual, li, as um, well as contemporary notions of subjectality, a Confucian Marxian materialist approach uh, to collective unconsciousness and social ritual. And wrapping up with an examination of soma aesthetic or bodily uh, practice. This results in an intercultural and interdisciplinary account of how a set of traditions, some newer and reacting to dominant traditions and others relatively older and with uh, longer histories of internal conceptual development, uh, still nonetheless converge on an important issue for philosophy generally, uh, understanding and uh, broadening the radically relational, discursive, bodily, uh, ritually implied self. Okay, let's get to it. Our first key word here is subjectivation. And Judith Butler follows Michel Foucault in uh, using a variant of this term, a uh, subjection um, in, in places to describe how melancholy defines the emergence of subjects uh, as the question of survival induces them to perform a kind of ritually driven life in order to gain recognition in the everyday. 
so these, this recognition coming from broader social forces. Um, Butler specifically breaks down her account in terms of five key paradigms. Uh, Hegel's unhappy consciousness, uh, Nietzsche's bad conscience, Freud's ego, uh, Althusser's interpolation, and Foucault's power resistance dynamic with bits from Lacan and there's a whole bunch of other stuff in, in there, but those are kind of the main paradigms at play. Now, um, all of these sources um, form her narrative of the body being turned on itself and trapped in a skin tight prison, sentenced to go through, through a rigmarole of ritual motions in order to get through the day with the repetition itself bringing a meager measure of freedom in the form of rage and the reappropriation of the terms of the ritual symbolic field. However, this view of rage's resistance as reappropriation offers little more uh, than uh, temp the temporary relief that a prisoner might have, uh, that might likewise obtain through using the routine of prison life against itself. Uh, so here uh, in this slide, uh, we, can, uh, we can imagine being sort of hailed in to a performance of a, a sort of script for gendered life that's initiated from like a, a prenatal or neonatal exam uh, uh, and declaration that it's a, it's a boy, it's a girl. And from there, um, a, a set of ritual performances um, uh, being uh, brought into being. So, um, the argument here starts from uh, the finding uh, that this subversive reclaiming of words like the N word or the F word um, that, uh, that Butler talks about in various places um, and um, her, her more extended um, uh, uh, notion of, of, um, of, of appropriating uh, uh, ritual norms of subjection, this can't be the end game. Uh, that even as an intermediate strategy, it should be but one approach. Uh, even with its somewhat satisfying, unsatisfying conclusions, Butler's paradigm nonetheless remains compelling as a framework for considering uh, subject life from kind of a worst case perspective and the challenge of uh, possibly improving the psychic dimension of life amidst the overwhelming machinations of power. So as a base premise, Butler holds that a subject's identity arises from external normativity, which initiates and continually takes up residence within an inner sphere of consciousness. In her view, what Hegel sees as the split between recognized master and recognizing slave internalized in unhappy consciousness, Nietzsche rearticulates in his notion of the bad conscience as a socially driven uh, split of the self into tormentor and tormented, creditor and debtor. Working having some issues with my mic apparently. Okay, forgive me. Okay. Um, continuing on. So, um, working from this convergence, Butler develops this insight in psychoanalytic terms, reasoning that melancholy occurs as social forces form the psyche with the social regulating the psychic sphere so that subject's conduct occurs within social norms. In her readings of Hegel, um, Nietzsche and Freud, social forces establish the layout of the mind, regulating it and foreclosing socially unacceptable behavior. Therefore for Butler, the social regulates the psychic leading to an internalizing, uh, a constitutive internalizing of society's values. All this enables the will to be tame enough to get by on society. The self being so constituted does not really possess its own will, but is formed in relation to others. Hence, in explaining the relational self, uh, Butler writes, quote, the will is not the will of a subject, nor is it an effect fully cultivated by and through social norms, end quote. She, su she suggests instead that the will is, quote, the site at which the social implicates the psychic in its very formation, or to be more precise, as its very formation and formativity, end quote. Moreover, her more uh, recent work sees Butler further repudiate the interesting posture taken by, quote, many people who act as if they were not formed. With her emphasis on relationality, she couches her critique in terms of Kierkegaard's notion of despair. She thus examines the anguish resulting from denying 
the place of God as the true author of human existence. Uh, to use similar, more secular language to flesh out her decidedly less theological project in terms of a common understanding of the misery that um, results from this chauvinistic insistence that one is uh, one's own sovereign person. End of story. And so, shoot. And so the subject is deeply relational. Butler goes on to distill her notion of a will that formatively turns on itself with the help of Louis Althusser. Imagine Louis Althusser's hypothetical scene where a police officer yells, hey, you there, you turn around and recognizing yourself in this hail with a literal turn of the, the, uh, of the neck, turning of the self back against the self, the self so recognized guiltily uh, submits to law before, uh, without any particular reason, without any particular warrant and becomes the you that was so addressed. I'm gonna um, turn over here to a, a fellow scholar on the subject uh, to further um, draw out what goes on with interpolation. Um, if you'll allow me, I'm gonna turn over to Professor Soldier Boy Tellum. Just to break the monotony, I know uh, on the one hand, I have a soothing voice, but there is also that uh, monotone that I always deal with. So hope everybody's a little bit awake. Dance party break. Okay, continuing things. Um, I'll, just as an aside, this is definitely a scene that I've had and uh, that in my work, Black Bodies That Matter, um, interpolation, and um, certainly is a major focus. Um, okay, segue complete. Uh, so this scene of interpolation, uh, not necessarily with a mall cop, uh, this is a scene that plays out a thousand times in the subject's life, where outright pejoratives, lesser slights, and indirect cultural messages all hail the subject into being, into acting out a certain, uh, a certain role, a kind of ominous, unsettling speech act of vocation being called into a mode of existence, a physician declaring it's a girl, or to put it in sort of more Cyrillian, Cyrillian speak, uh, it's hereby a girl. Uh, this is a speech act uh, calling the infant to be, to look and to act in certain ways. Calls to be this and or that, enact the psychic constitution of particular subjects and enable the performance of roles, highlighting the discursive character of subjectivation. This one, oh. so, oh. pardon me. Subject life is dealing with some AV issues. Please forgive me. It's my first time doing this presentation in this format. Okay, so continuing on. Um, the scene of Althusser's, like Hegel's master-slave antagonism and the imposition of bad conscience in Nietzsche's creditor-debtor model greatly influenced the subjectivation model put forward by Butler. Uh, but the scene is seldom uh, reducible just to two parties. Uh, indeed, for Foucault, those granting recognition are themselves subjects, uh, watching and surveilling each other in society's grand self-regulating panoptical prison. In any case, similarly pernicious effects result. The subject body unthinkingly turns on itself, uh, disciplined and preternaturally ready to submit, be it to Althusser's singular authority or that of innumerable, invisible, displaced, and paradoxically ubiquitous others. This body ready to turn on itself is initially inchoate, undefined and unintelligible in a way that Butler likens to Aristotelian prime matter. Calls to be this or that, uh, uh, be this and or that, uh, stamp raw bodily matter into a recognizable form. These impressions form a subject where the subject is a body that matters and in order to matter, betrays itself continually uh, for continued subject life or at least the promise thereof. This calls attention to the bodily uh, uh, nature of subjectivation. 
noticing my little typo there. Wonderful. Continuing on. Before long, the subject ego uh, con is continually comporting its, uh, the body in order to achieve a dubious form of recognition uh, from society. Taking up Foucault's language, repetition becomes the basis for discipline, whether it um, be, be within physical prison walls or those figuratively built by society as a means of control. Within this repetition, behavior thus becomes pattern, while conduct becomes a type of ritual performance uh, driven by a need to maintain a level of recognition and legitimacy. This shows subjectivation have a profoundly ritualistic character. Now, this turning of the self back upon the self happens in such a way that there's no inside or outside prior to this formative turn, because that barrier is precisely what is being formed between oneself and other. There's no core, no eternal soul that comes prior to the social implication of the psyche for Butler. Peeling back the onion only yields more onion and sifting through the uh, sediment of past social relationships only unearths more sediment. There is no redemption in the sense of recovery of original essence or original soul, precisely because the soul qua psyche so considered is not a pre-given quantity being instead always in the making. This marks a break with conventional notions of the soul. And in this regard, the project becomes less about redemption and more about rehabilitation. Oh, I think I'm missing some stuff here. Okay, forgive me. Um, okay, I got a little bit off the script, but okay, uh, in any case. Um, so um, even though uh, Butler doesn't put it this way in her reading of Nietzsche, uh, and the imposition of slave morality, the implication is there that the challenge within Butler's schema is that of gaining or perhaps regaining the sense of nobility um, that has been foreclosed for this relational, discursive, bodily, and ritually impelled subject. Tabling the issue of subject nobility for the moment, Butler looks to Nietzsche's bad conscience and Freud's id ego superego dynamic for inspiration here, particularly as concerns the former, uh, former's remark that bad conscience fabricates the soul. For both Nietzsche and Butler, this fabrication is artistic in nature. This means that the subject, the co-articulation of some psychic form and somatic matter is itself a work of art created by our moral life. In appropriating Nietzsche, Butler describes uh, the subject as quote, uh, a kind of necessary fiction, being also uh, one of the first artistic accomplishments uh, presupposed by morality, end quote. Following Nietzsche, Butler describes bad conscience as, quote, the instinct for freedom made latent, end quote. She continues and reminiscent of Nietzsche claims that this form of self-consciousness is a peculiar form of artistry and that, quote, the soul is precisely what a certain violent artistry pr produces when it takes itself as its own object, end quote. However, Butler does not adequately follow up on the link between art and freedom, neither within the context of her analysis of Nietzsche nor within the broader scope of her project. Uh, Regarding Nietzsche, it's almost as though her appropriation of his work stops precisely at the second stage of what is Zarathustra calls the metamorphoses of spirit, that of the lion, of the beast who snarls no and violently refuses the dragon that embodies a thousand years of old values with its golden scales, each emblazoned with a gleaming thou shalt. That's not my poetry, that's Nietzsche. Considered in these terms, Butler follows much of Nietzsche's template regarding the assumption of society's burdens and norms in the first camel stage and a subsequent contrarian denial of those values in the second lion stage. But she by and large disregards the third stage, the child stage. Understood in terms of Nietzsche's Zarathustra, that means that after saying yes to conventional norms and saying no to impose internalized morality as the lion does, there is little room in Butler's view for psychic life beyond everyday good and evil. In her account, there's no joy of saying yes to oneself and to artistry, to constructive artistry, a new type of moral artistry, to spontaneity and to the creation of novel values for the self. Now, it may well be the case that Zarathustra's particular deus ex machina resolution of dancing with eternity would ill serve the more sober work of Foucault and Butler on subjectivation slash subjection. But putting the eccentricities, yeah, eccentricities, I always, I'm always 50-50 on that word. Putting the eccentricities of Nietzsche's project aside, there still remains the challenge set forth by him of affirming this relational, discursive, bodily, and ritually impelled subject life in a way that links artistry and autonomy 
and here I'm going to get back to my PowerPoint presentation, looking at our second keyword after subjectivation, autonomy. So um, recognition is uh, supposed to grant autonomy. Uh, when we take on a social role, when we follow out a, a script, a sort of ritualized uh, performance of identity, that's supposed to ensure our survival. But it turns out this ends up being an illusion. Uh, if we're looking at this in terms of Butler's own work, uh, this is cashed out in terms of rage. Uh, her paradigmatic example is going to be that of a, uh, of a closeted uh, homosexual who, in taking up conventional gender roles in order to survive, finds that survival to be um, a, um, a matter of diminishing returns over time, given the price paid. Uh, leading to a questioning of the whole damn bargain and rage. Um, and that's basically where Butler ends the cycle of life of power and much, most of her sub, uh, later work, that, that rage against the, the bargain of subjectivation is kind of all that you have at the end of the day because there's no outside to power relations. One can't step outside of the grounds of one's constitution to uh, fight against the, that constitution without undoing, without dissimulating the constitutive knot, as she puts it. So resistance is futile. Any nerds out there? Hello, I just outed myself. Butler follows Nietzsche through this first two metamorphoses as said, but doesn't go to the child stage. And so we don't get that creative affirmation of new values. Where's the artistry? And this is what I want to try to inject into this strain of critical theory from Foucault and Butler, where um, frankly, it ends up being um, kind of grim. Uh, I appreciate that it's grim, that it's so, it's such a thorough worst case scenario for conceptualizing power and uh, the challenges facing the individual subject. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I, I've always found the conclusions lacking. And so, um, no. um, yes, okay, good. Uh, so what's needed here is a reconsideration of autonomy, um, particularly of how the subject attains this dubious state in and through the other. Butler's paradigm explores how the need to survive and be recognized as a valid subject marks the subject as mediated, um, as mediated self-consciousness in the mode of Hegel. Um, this means uh, that rather than immediately expressing the will in the matter of artistic creativity praised by Nietzsche, the will instead doubles back on itself and uses its now deformed artistry to devise new ways to torment itself with this implement called conscience, so as to, so to try, however, haltingly to pay back the debt owed to its other as part of the uh, subject's continued supposedly autonomous existence. However, this constellation of autonomy, artistry, and the other need not be the end of the story. And indeed, the first phase of this argument involves reconfiguring these notions in terms of artworks. Simply put, people aren't the only kinds of other. The world presents objects, natural or artificial, that variously make claims on us, demanding that attention be given to what is variously sublime or beautiful. I mean, this is my Kantianism showing. Uh, honing uh, attention to what is made, what is contingent, uh, and nevertheless powerful in art's claim on our attention and its ability to speak to the subject uh, can show the ability of artworks to serve as a different kind of other uh, through which the subject might enter into a, a mode of self-recognition. Simply put, we have experiences where we get a sense of ourselves through art, knowing oneself, self-consciousness. Why does it always have to be so anthropocentric? So art can be that different kind of other. And even though these moments might be fleeting, uh, they're not so much, they're not so bound up in, in the demand that the subject take a self monitoring, self berating posture uh, and uh, wielding the force of conscience to determine itself as this or that kind of subject in order to survive. It's not the same kind of stakes. Because it doesn't arrive from the Faustian bargain for survival that characterizes subject life, uh, the less deterministic brand of autonomy manifest in art. An artifice makes it possible to begin to recognize the contingency at the heart of the human world and all of its power structures, thereby loosening the stifling structures of subjectivation. Turning to art is only a start. The second phase is making one's own bodily life 
and artwork, and indeed a different kind of other. And so the argument presented here applies this notion of self-recognition uh, through art uh, to the ritualized subject body formed in the course of subjectivation. This makes sense as subjectivation is all about turning a body uh, on, uh, about a body turning on itself in order to gain recognition through embodying social roles, uh, norms and uh, roles ritually performed in everyday life. The question then turns to developing an account of artful ritual cultivation of the body. And this is where a turn to East Asian philosophy can be of help. So um, I don't know what the, um, what, what, what the acquaintance level is with uh, East Asian philosophy and Confucianism here. So forgive me if this is at all patronizing, but I'll just try to uh, lay out the general terms vis-a-vis -vis this project. So Butler and the thinkers crucial to her account are already somewhat at odds with the dominant orientation of the Euro-American tradition, which itself doesn't provide many resources for talking about ritual and bodily that do not at some point lapse into mind-body dualism uh, on a hierarchical. Uh, in a hierarchical mode, and where that's going to end up sort of uh, um, putting her behind the eight ball and explaining her framework, uh, just the language is going to be trapping already. So she runs up against this and talking about the grammar of, of subject life uh, quite often. So why not step out of this tradition and these geographic bounds, especially when there are so many intriguing insights into ritual and body? Why not look at a body of thought which excels in its sensitivity to the A, rel relational, B, discursively uh, uh, form uh, self to uh, the body and to ritual performance, uh, and which also has the benefit of being more attuned to the artful side of subject life than we see in post-structuralism. Why not look to sources like this? Why not, at least as a starting point uh, for the time being, uh, look to uh, what may be the, East, uh, the, the most influential tradition uh, in East Asia, namely Confucianism. So uh, Confucianism stems from what Carl Jaspers calls the axial age. This is the defining period for Athenian philosophy and for Buddhism as well, uh, around 500 to 400 BCE. Um, and uh, where Confu Confucianism is still living tradition uh, set the stage for ensuing East Asian uh, philosophical schools continues to furnish a great deal of, of the basic vocabulary for both academic discourse and for everyday life in the region with Confucian perspectives on role-based ethics, ritual and family uh, proving extremely influential up into the present day. Now the benefit of Confucianism in all of its various guises that can speak in its own voice about becoming a person, it supplies its own vocabulary of body and ritual without having to fight back against a couple millennia of Western philosophy. Um, so, um, a, uh, and that it ends up going through so many um, internal debates within Confucianism and against other schools about ritual and about body, it ends up anticipating a lot of uh, forks, a lot of, uh, a lot of junctures in debates that a post-structuralist, I think in their various ways are themselves hitting upon. Uh, Johnny and Janie come lately, as they may be. So um, getting a little more technical here um, and past the introduction to Confucianism, I want to introduce the third key word um, to my project. Um, after subjectivation and this reconsideration of autonomy, I'm turning to Li. Um, so um, Li might be unfamiliar to you. Um, but but um, I, I want to use this term here again to have um, a, 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 a less baggage laden um, uh, terminological basis. So, um, a, a, and one that ends up uh, really hitting upon these four dimensions of the self as relational, discursive, uh, bodily, and, um, and ritually impelled. So, Li uh, means ritual propriety, and it uh, broadly connotes everything from the subtly ritually habitual uh, to grandiose formalities. Uh, Li, um, though I'm speaking of it here in the singular, just for the sake of a smooth translation, it's a bit more ambiguous. It um, also is, it has a kind of a plural meaning when we're looking at this in uh, Chinese. Um, and it, it's looking at the ritual acts of um, uh, that sort of make up the everyday. Um, my professor, Roger Ames, 
explains a Li as a kind of social grammar. Um, Li, as Confucius puns in a few um, places, um, provides knowledge of where to stand. So here I have a little bit of a, a, a exploration of the Chinese characters. Um, there's a lot of punning in Chinese with, with homophones. Uh, li as ritual propriety is um, paired punningly with li, meaning to stand. And um, li coordinates the where and when of social comings and goings. Li attends to gesture and comportment. It describes how the players and the audience each take their various places and act just so uh, and at just the right time. Li forms a pair with yue or music, or maybe more precisely musical theater, uh, having connections to all arts by way of synecdoche. Li uh, brings a convergence of bodily movement and moral excellence. Li is both a social grammar and a social choreography. Li encompasses uh, what the classifications of academic philosophy might label the ethical and aesthetic uh, nature of the relational self. Li speaks to how language stands in society. Li connects the regulation of cultural expression and of society. It sets up codes of di uh, difference and deferral in the basic historical movement of discourse. Li addresses much of what Derrida does with his notion of difference. Li expresses how the discursive climate defines how people live up or down to social role archetypes. Li describes the body that stands. Li relates linguistically to T, to the corpus, with a sense surpassing simple physical matter, in Chinese pointing to dynamic ongoing arrangement of bodies. Li grounds self-cultivation, xiuxian in Chinese, literally habituating the person, the body. Li addresses the role of, uh, of ritual in physical growth, coordination and habituation. Li works in relational processes. Li, which depending on the context, as I mentioned, could be rendered in the singular or the plural, thus deals both with individual human bodies and with human bodies politic. Here we have a connection between these two characters, Li for ritual propriety and Ti for body. Uh, you can notice um, the right side of each character um, having a similar component, the sacrificial vase of flowers. Uh, again, there's a lot of punning within the Chinese um, lexicon and, and the classics connecting up these terms. So Li provides knowledge where to stand, of when to stand, conditions social relations. It establishes bounds and bidirectional demands between ruler and advisor, between parent and child. It refers to a ritual-based sense of appropriateness, uh, yeah. including knowing when and how to call out an inappropriate um, failure to fulfill a name or role. In sum, Li uh, points to the thread running through human development and through the work of Butler and Foucault as well, uh, the artful process of cultural sedimentation and normative subjectivation. And noticing the time, I'm gonna maybe hit the afterburner here a little bit and try to speed things up. Um, but what I want to suggest here is that Li so understood um, that it might um, uh, not just serve as a power, um, that, 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 that we're, if we're looking at Li and ritual in this sense, that uh, ritual might not just be a tool of power against the subject, that forms the subject, um, but that it could be perhaps a tool for the subject's self-cultivation. Um, that there might be a way to understand Li as um, empowering the subject and not just uh, uh, being a mode that subjects the subject to uh, power. Uh, and um, where Li, I, I think it might be possible um, with the right sort of orientation, uh, where it might be possible to upset the basic dynamic of contingency and necessity and autonomy that underlies subjectivation. The subject appears contingent in the face of the mass of necessary power and where um, there's a promise of autonomy within power networks that, that uh, grants the individual existence, however contingent. Um, what I want to suggest is that these basic terms of contingency, necessity, and autonomy can themselves be revised. So 
getting to this, I'm going to pivot now to a contemporary philosopher, Li Zihe. Uh, he just recently turned 90. And if it weren't for COVID, I would be next month in Slovenia celebrating his birthday with him. But I don't think that's going to come to pass. Um, in any case, subjectality is Li Zihe's uh, key um, paradigm. It's a central contribution. Li Zihe's work is available in English, uh, largely from the University of Hawaii Press. I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, it is um, quite engaging um, for, for people with a critical theory orientation. Um, his understanding of, uh, of a number of Western traditions um, being propelled with in insights from, from Chinese philosophy is, is really quite compelling. Uh, I have a couple of his works up here, The Path of Beauty, uh, Chinese Aesthetics, and Four Lectures on Aesthetics, all of which I highly recommend. In any case, subjectality is the fourth key term uh, for me and my work after uh, subjectivation, um, autonomy, which I'm trying to rework, and this term li, or ritual propriety. And so subjectality, this is the neologism uh, from Li Zihe, uh, and uh, this speaks to the historical roots of subject life and the use of collective cultural psychology in defining human society. I basically want to say uh, that subjectality is um, corresponding on the macro level, um, the, the level of society, to uh, what Butler sets up with subjectivation on the micro level of the individual and the, the dynamics of a, uh, of a um, constitutive, um, uh, of a constitutive foreclosure um, uh, uh, that, that makes a, a person uh, have a, 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 an identity as an individual subject, that a similar dynamic happens with our collective unconsciousness as well, that we are foreclosed from the roots of our social patterns and rituals. Uh, so briefly, uh, Lee uses um, a, a blend of Kant, Marx, and Confucius to, to um, address this line of thinking. And um, he uses Marx's statements on the humanization of nature and the naturalization of humanity to explain how shamanistic art, music, and rituals operated as tools for social cohesion in the early material economy of human survival. And so moving forward historically, uh, Li Zihe sees Confucianism as being particularly apt, uh, not, not the only way to do this, but just being you know, a really good way of doing it, at describing and formalizing uh, the cultural psychological edifice which sediments over time and subject rationality. We can think of our ritual practices as covering each other over um, with, with time and where the roots of why we are arranged in, in certain ritualistic ways become unknown to us as we progress forward uh, at, within a, a cultural framework. And so um, for uh, Lee, the, uh, the idea is that by devoting oneself to, uh, to ritual propriety in a certain way, that one is kind of unearthing the sediment um, and bringing the, uh, the roots of, of, uh, of unconscious ritual habit to life, making uh, our, our ritual presence conscious being, being the key. So um, subjectivation on the individual level is useful for talking about the machinery of person making, but it can lose sight of the techne behind the machine. Li Zihe attends this oversight with his notion of subjectality and the formation of collective ritual normative structures. Subjectality on the macro level um, extends uh, subject, subjectivation on the micro level by showing the constitutive role of artistic creativity in the unconscious rhythm of the everyday. This rhythm, this background hum of ritual practice on the macro level can become a symphony when properly attuned in one's individual life. This is what it means to refine Li in practices like Tai Chi and the martial arts, where the body takes on a life of its own. This is autonomy. And this is what we see with it as a different kind of art of other, a more artful kind of other. So these practices Trans, thus transform rigid, regular, and sometimes punishing discipline into a type of learn uh, and practice spontaneity. 
this phrasing might seem counterintuitive, not outright contradictory. Uh, but disciplined spontaneity accords well with common phenomena. I don't know if anybody here plays music, but you spend years playing bloody scales going up and down. And after doing a whole bunch of rote work, um, eventually a capability for improvisation um, sets in. Eventually a person is able to range freely um, from that very regulated, very disciplined basis. The idea uh, within Confucianism generally is that a kind of moral virtuosity is possible. Um, th th that um, in devoting oneself to ritual practice, uh, where ritual has a sort of uh, link to music, that that kind of improvis uh, improvisational ability um, with, uh, is possible within um, our everyday walk and talk, within our everyday social life. Um, I'm gonna bypass some pertinent material here in the interest of time, unfortunately. Um, but uh, what I wanna suggest here is that this approach from Li Tzu does really well in responding to that opening Foucault quote that it must cease forever describing the effects of power in negative terms. It excludes, it represses, it suppresses, it censors, it abstracts, it masks, it conceals. In fact, power produces, it produces reality, it produces domains of objects and rituals of truth. Um, and, um, shoot, okay. So, um, what we get when we engage in rit ritual practice, when we unearth the sediment of, uh, of, uh, of ritual practices that have um, accrued over decades and centuries and have become covered over and opaque to themselves, um, that what, what we end up doing is we show ourselves that all of our previously unconscious walk and talk was itself made, that it was itself contingent, that everything that seems necessary and big and looming over us, forming individuals from the position of power, all of that grand edifice is itself constructed, just as the self is constructed. It just looms larger uh, and seems because of this, uh, this sedimentation over time to, uh, to have a force of necessity, which it ultimately doesn't. Now, the final key term that I have to share here, and I'm, I'm skipping past a good deal of material, so please forgive me. Uh, this is Soma Aesthetics. And this is the, uh, the uh, major paradigm advanced by Florida Atlantic University professor Richard Schusterman. Um, for those of you that are interested in the body, I highly recommend getting into his, uh, his work, starting with Body Consciousness from Cambridge University Press. Uh, they also run a really great uh, conference each year, usually in February uh, at, in Boca Raton um, uh, that, that um, it can be, be a good, good entree into uh, considering the body and, and positioning it more prominently within, um, within Western philosophy. Um, in any case, um, sorry, I might be getting chat message here. Forgive me. Uh, I'm trying to DJ things and I'm dealing with a stupid computer that wants to do an update right now. Um, okay, forgive me, please. Okay. A couple of FAU and LUM. Okay. I see. Yeah. Um, so in any case, um, some aesthetics as our um, final key word for this presentation. And uh, basically what um, Schusterman is advancing is uh, the idea that the body is a source of knowledge and that um, by engaging in a variety of ritual practices, um, he includes things like, uh, let's see, uh, various diets, forms of grooming and decoration, including body painting, piercing, and scarification, as well as more familiar modes of cos cosmetics, jewelry, and clothing, fashions, dance, yoga, massage, aerobics, bodybuilding, calisthenics, martial, and erotic arts, 
uh, and psychosomatic, modern psychosomatic disciplines like Alexander Technique and Feldenkrais Method. Um, the idea being that um, philosophy is deficient to the extent that it um, fails to pay attention to um, bodily sources of knowledge and where engaging in these practices um, can um, provoke bodily awareness, particularly of one's unconscious habits, the things that we think are necessary about how we appear in the everyday, the way that we slouch in our presence amongst people, that these can be reconstituted. These things are formed, these things are contingent, and that they can be refashioned and remade. This is what we get in engaging in soma aesthetic practice, burrowing through the sediment of everything that, uh, uh, burrowing through the, through, through the sediment of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, ritual life uh, historically. And so soma aesthetics takes the idea of Li and makes it more accessible and uh, perhaps useful in contemporary debates. Um, uh, Schusterman's body consciousness deals with um, gender and sexuality, um, it, it deals with um, sort of Wittgensteinian challenges about sort of private language arguments and uh, where there might be an attempt to do an end run around that with looking at the body. In any case, um, what we get from, from Schusterman and this notion of soma aesthetics is a uh, further uh, framework for considering how engaging in uh, bodily practices can upset the, the stakes of uh, necessary power and contingent individual uh, that, that, uh, and that can perhaps give some level, if not freedom, then some level of nobility to this individual who is up, who it might be, might've been previously um, somewhat enslaved within um, w w within uh, a series of ritual scripts for uh, continued existence. Okay, um, realizing that we're uh, getting close to the end here, um, I'm going to wrap get to the the end of my text. Uh, so what I am doing in my project is. Um, a little bit different than what Butler is presenting. I want to say that for Butler, what we get with rage as an endpoint, this is, is chapter six of Psychological Power, and also some of our more recent works, is basically um, a faith in uh, a Nietzschean notion of sign chains, where um, in the introduction of, uh, in between the introduction of a term and um, its continued existence over time, that a term. Uh, changes its meaning as it circulates. Uh, Nietzsche is the image of a coin circulating and becoming worn and unrecognizable over time. Uh, so where a word like the N-word, uh, a term of subjection um, in, in slavery might be used, reappropriated, twisted, and become the N-word that ends in an A, that is a, a form of recognition that I can say, and you can't, uh, most of you in the audience, just judging from the Zoom visuals. Um, in any, uh, that's pretty much always the case in a philosophy, uh, uh, philosophy setting anyways, but enough about the demographics of our discipline. Um, what I want to say is that what Butler is doing is basically, um, looking to sign chains rusting over time and making that the strategy. And this for me is, um, very unsatisfying. The assertion being made here in this project is somewhat different. The claim is that it's possible to use the sign chains of power to chain power. That it's possible to tie power in its own knots. With subjectality theory and some aesthetic practice, drawing attention to the contingency of entrenched power structures, there exists the possibility of new forms of self-recognition not fixed by the terribly sublime necessity of the powers that be. This is to say that by feeding the basic premises of a system back upon itself, paradoxes unanticipated by that system may result. Here, some aesthetic practice informed by subjectality takes one of the major rules for subject life, namely that it be ritually regulated and repeated and uses ritual self-regulation to expose the contingency of those originally given rules. And so in keeping with Butler's approach to resistance, this approach does not 
uh, my approach does not uh, posit the, the use of anything beyond the sign chains already there, nor does it depend on miraculous redemption a la Nietzsche. Uh, but, be, but going beyond Butler's approach and the negativity and rage to which it necessarily and with good right leads, I'm a pretty negative uh, and rageful person on occasion myself, the claim here is that turning attention to the aesthetic life of power, uh, reconsidering the life of power in this way can open up some minor possibility for affirmation and hope. So um, to take what may be a more familiar and pleasantly accessible example, I want you to consider The Wizard of Oz. Sorry, sorry. Not simply. Forgive me, everybody. I uh, do want to. Okay, forgive me. Um, Let's try this again. Okay, so the goal here okay. is to. Oh, okay, forgive me. I'm going crazy and I hate this computer. Give me just one quick moment. Let's try this again. I'm just going to do it from this part. Moving on now. Seeing past the imposing simulacrum of the Wizard of Oz to the doddering figure at the machine does not change the circumstances for Dorothy and the rest, but knowing that his power is similarly contingent allows the heroes to realize that they have been able to face uh, those circumstances with this less grandiose type of power all along. Now, nothing so dramatic as an all revealing pull of the curtain is possible in the case of the subject for subjectivation takes place through a multitude of encounters where countless different rituals are enacted with a variety of other subjects. But just as subjectivation occurs from a thousand different points, uh, so too can a thousand tiny curtains be pulled back in a thousand particular uh, contexts, all aggregating into burgeoning recognition of the ultimate contingency of subjectivation's rites and rituals. The material, bodily, and soma aesthetic work of realizing this contingency takes place across a manifold of settings and does not erase the subject's basic needs. Still gotta pay your mortgage. Meaning that there's no easy answer like that of Dorothy tapping her heels together three times and chanting, there's no place like home. Home does not even make sense for this kind of relational subject, this kind of soul in the making, if only because the fragmented discipline of subject life proves so far from home, so uncanny, so unheimlich, that it precludes any simple A to B and back again narrative. Indeed, the deeply public nature of appearance and the social nature of, uh, of ritual indicate that whatever limited improvement may be possible might not, be, might not rest in an atomically individual subject per se, as indeed Butler herself raises the question, quote, what difference does it make when bodies act in concert together? Nevertheless, even if nothing like Zarathustra's redemption of the will or a ruby slipper return trip to Kansas is in the offing, Exposing the contingency of subjectivation through conscious uh, ritual work on the, bodily, uh, on the body and on bodily norms can bring genuine improvement to uh, the plight of subjects generally. And so to sum up, this approach doesn't completely solve the problems of subjectivation, but by providing a new sense of autonomy through conscious attention uh, to how Li in the process of su subjectality uh, leads to a, a sedimentation of techniques and appearance in collective unconsciousness, some aesthetic practices can ameliorate the dilemma bit by bit. This approach is meant to supplement rather than supplant resistance strategies um, exploiting sign chain rust by also creating tension with sign chain knots. The claim being advanced in this project is that by confronting the effects of subjectivation and, um, and obtaining newfound autonomy with conscious attention to Li, subjectality, and some aesthetic feeling. Subjects can go past what Slavoj Žižek and his criticism of Butler terms mere performative reconfiguration within the hegemonic field. This means appropriating 
the technologies of the self that produce subjects for use on the self. This results in a restructuring of the playing field as Zizek wishes, and perhaps sets a new direction for critical theory, one hopes. Moreover, a framework so built on notions of subjectivation, autonomy, li, subjectality, and soma aesthetics furthers the enterprise of intercultural philosophy. This approach advances intercultural thinking by pointing to a fruitful convergence being possible amidst supposedly disparate bodies of thought. And it does so not out of intellectual vanity, although there is that in abundance, uh, but in its response to a genuine philosophical call to think through how the relational, discursive, bodily, and ritually uh, impelled subject might encounter itself anew as a work of art hewn with other subjects in the medium of every, everyday practice. So that about wraps it up for me. This is going to appear again uh, next year in the early part of 2021 from SUNY Press. Stay safe and thank you. Hey, um, so I want to uh, thank our speaker. I Please forgive the technical foibles thank our there. Speaker. Um, and uh, so as is our usual practice, we're now going to take a five minute break. So everyone can um, get something to drink, use the bathroom, et cetera. And then uh, we'll come back and have a Q&A session. Um, and anyone who has a question can, you know, tell me in the chat and then I'll call people in the order that that happens. So I will see you all in five minutes. Thank you all. Okay, so um, back and uh, <laughs> waiting for questions. I know there were some questions when the grad students left. Yes. Okay. Oh, Robbie. Okay. Hi, James. Thanks so much uh, for the talk. Uh, so I'm really interested in the aesthetic dimensions of your project and the way in which art can be a mode of resistance to oppressive norms kind of generally. So I wanted to pick up on maybe a small point in one of your slides and maybe it'll lead into my larger question. So it, it was the slide about, um, I'm going to mispronounce the name, Lisa Ho, uh, where you talked about uh, attuning ourselves to aesthetically valuable rhythms in nature. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder, first of all, if you can just say a bit more about what those are and like what an example of an aesthetically valuable rhythm in nature is. And the reason to ask that, I'll just sort of anticipate the kind of larger question, is that um, given the emphasis in your work and in critical theory on the contingency of our practices and the way that they're always revisable, um, it sounds like one reading of aesthetically valuable uh, patterns in nature sounds like those are precisely non-contingent and they're going to be something that um, uh, might not be uh, so amenable to revision in the same way. It depends on the full story about how they get integrated into and overlaid with the cultural and social dimension of practices. But um, yeah, if I could just hear a bit more about your thoughts on that uh, and kind of aesthetically valuable in nature. Okay. Yeah, I think I can answer this, Robbie. And it's a good uh, set of questions. Um, so I, I did glide over this material in the interest of time, uh, unfortunately, uh, to talk about attuning to a rhythm. But uh, the basic notion here is going to be an extension of what Marx um, unpacks in, in the 1844 Paris manuscripts with regard to the humanization of nature and the naturalization of humanity. Now I mentioned the terms, but I didn't get into it. Um, more precisely, uh, what uh, Marx has in mind there is um, the way in which our labor arrangements, which can be basically seen as a ritual um, for social organization, that these op, um, stand at sort of the uh, pivot point between human and nature. So where our rituals um, on, are on the one hand, we have the humanization of nature where we go out and cut things down and rah, 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 and we inscribe ourselves on nature. And then there's the uh, naturalization of humanity where our 
work rhythms are seasonal, uh, where uh, environmental factor, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have this dialectic that emerges and where at the pivot point of this dialectic is going to be ritual. Uh, um, and ritual ends up um, being an immaterial, but basically material component of uh, the economics of human survival. And um, for Li Zihou, um, the basis of beauty, and this, this comes um, in a couple of different places, but the path of beauty would be a, a probably good place to get to start with this, um, where the, the, the origin of beauty, um, he's kind of doing a, um, there's a little bit of a foray into sort of paleo aesthetics and, 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 uh, and whatnot, but, the, but basically um, uh, a success in attuning um, uh, one so and it, like uh, he uses like, like uh, work songs and, and things like that, uh, um, where our first um, artistic productions were likely attuned to those natural rhythms, and that's um, and indicative of that sort of nexus between uh, ritual and music that we get in the Confucian account. Um, so, um, where it's not just um, about survival, but but this also ends up being the, the basis of our sort of aesthetic sensibility. And, and um, where um, the um, where we feel a, a success with our aesthetic endeavors, um, leads I was going to trace it back ultimately to some sort of, um, in a very very broad sense, a, a natural attunement. And so to go to your uh, question, building on this, um, yeah. Uh, so you say that the, these these. Um, that, that such attunement might not be um, to uh, might not be so contingent, and that's precisely the point. That it is, uh, we have um, underneath all the. So I, I I didn't get into sedimentation theory, but we can think of you know two thousand years ago a certain labor arrangement making sense. Uh, this pivot point between nature and humanity. And the, those labor arrangements take on a life of their own and become, and, and those labor arrangements being material uh, and that material covering itself over, stratifying and whatnot, becoming opaque to itself. And this is how Lito is going to talk about human, humanity's collective unconsciousness, all of our ritual whatnot being those layers of sediment. And um, where um, exactly how the sediment gets layered, that's all contingent. That doesn't have to necessarily go anywhere. But underneath it all, yeah, there is going to be a deeper sort of natural rhythm uh, that uh, my daily ritual bodily practice would be tapping into. And basically cutting past the BS uh, is, is the point. Um, so what, what you're saying there uh, is, uh, my response is, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can yeah, can I, if I can just sort of quickly follow up, I, I guess that I kind of find that surprising um, that there is this sort of natural bedrock uh, that's taken to, if you like, objectively underlie our practices and perhaps even set some kind of standard by which we could assess whether or not a particular revision to a practice is going in the right direction. It sounds like the closer we get deeper and deeper in this sedimented metaphor to the kind of bedrock, the better our practices will be doing. But I mean, I guess I just would maybe want to push back on that and think that couldn't a subject experience these aesthetically valuable or purportedly aesthetically valuable rhythms as themselves oppressive? Like, you know, couldn't I find the rhythms of the seasons and the necessity of working during the daytime really oppressive uh, to my sense of myself? And if so, would I be making a mistake of some kind? Mm -hmm. um... So the short answer, and I, I always hate these Q&A sessions because I usually think of an answer like the next day or, or something, but uh, the short answer off the top of my head is, yeah, they certainly can be oppressed of these ritual structures. That one of the things that we deal with looking at uh, Confucian tradition and particularly somebody like Li Zihou, who's coming at things from a you know, not exclusively Confucian perspective with a whole boatload of critical theory there, um, that um, it's going to be... Um, uh, um, an, an active point of contention within the tradi tradition uh, that yeah, ritual can be freaking suffocating is all hell. I, like the like Confucian formalism is um, uh, it, it is uh, beyond daunting, and uh, where 
uh, ritual just ends up being a byword for conformity um, in the service of you know, uh, oppressive hierarchical uh, family structures uh, in the case of Confucianism. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely a possibility. And um, where um, the that the, the, um, I, mean, I, I think ultimately the, the, there's no like silver bullet against this this worry, but the 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 the, the bulwark that you have is going to be the, the, like going back to nature itself at some level um, that that uh, that, that nature is going to to um, if we go back to like this Marxian thing the, the naturalization of humanity and humanization of nature. That um, if I can quote the uh, philosopher uh, Ian Malcolm, life finds a way. Um, that that um, nature is going to push back uh, on some level, and that it's going to, despite our attempts to rein it into submission uh, and the, the kind of ritual, you know, uh, the confining ritual structures we might try to build up on, on top of that, that it's going to push through on some level and show up as a, a dim, a dimly accessible resource on some level. Does that make sense? And I'm kind of, I want to uh, give a shout out here to a particular, I'm drawing on um, this this person, uh, he was at Duke at the time, I, I'm not sure where he is now, his name is David Quayman Kim. Uh, he wrote a book called Melancholic Freedom, which uh, was his approach to, uh, to Butler and this, uh, all the work on melancholy there, and where his response was to go down the Kantian sublime as an answer, looking at nature uh, as a re nature as a different kind of other. Um, I'm going with beauty and and art rather than than, than nature as a setting up that different kind of other encounter. But um, his his thinking is also kind of informing my take on Lee Zaho and this whole constellation. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Um. <clears throat> Allie has a question. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I, I think everything you're interested in is extremely, extremely interesting. And I wrote down every single person that you suggested we read and will like, I'm making a genuine commitment to read all of these oh. things because like, I'm so excited. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about Soma Aesthetics and um, other aesthetics and mm -hmm. Um, the, okay, so this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking like, I think that like, we probably all agree that like all media of art are in some ways self-expressive and in some ways um, allow for the artist to recognize themselves and have others recognize them. Um, and of course, like all works of art, um, like require the body in some sense like the the painter is using their arm presumably mm -hmm. and like the musician is also like right like there's some bodily acts in and all art making um but there's something about soma aesthetics that's like okay the body is like importantly different like now it's not just like the creation of the work but now like the body is in some sense the work right like I mean, I, I have like a little bit of background in philosophy of dance. So like, I think a lot about dancing, but I think this would make sense from like most Soma aesthetics. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering like, if you can tell us more about like, if that makes a difference in like what you're saying and like now, like now art is constitutive of the self and like the self is now like the art and, and like how that plays into like the empowerment of the self and and like the body is like the subject of the work and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I, I'll see if I can fish uh, a, a decent answer here. Um, I, I guess I would say that um, with, 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 with some aesthetics, um, the this, this sort of, um, I, idea is that 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 uh, if we look at philosophy on, on some level uh, and I, th I think that you can I mean, within a, a vaguely you know Hellenistic kind of thing that uh, philosophy is supposed to be about some kind of self-improvement 
right? Uh, but it's all, uh, but going from, you know, our, the basis of Socratic basis, it is uh, self-improvement through a dedication to the life of mind. And that um, this is how one acquires wisdom. This is how one enlarges and expands the self. And um, I, I was trying while you were uh, uh, writing your question, I was trying to find actually uh, online, I was going to quote uh, Schusterman directly, but I'll just try to paraphrase um, stupid Google books. Um, but um, where um, the, the, con the contention is that the body is a valuable, if not equally valuable, if not potentially more valuable as a, um, a as a source of knowledge and a path to um, growth of the self. And um, so it, it's some aesthetics is going a little bit past this I idea. I mean, so what, what you say about um, the role of the, the body in art, art, arts in general is, is true. Uh, but the, the um, what's, uh, what's of more interest to, to Schusterman is um, going to be um, the, the way in which, um, well, one, the, the body not being necessarily distinct from uh, mind. So uh, I, I should actually back up, he uses the term soma um, to try to step out of the kind of mind-body hierarchical dualisms uh, that I was identifying earlier and like why I was wanting to go to the Lee kind of language just to escape that, that framework. Uh, but um, where um, he's largely drawing on uh, like a um, Dewey and pragmatist basis. So if you had to like source Schusterman uh, um, uh, within uh, a particular ism, it's gonna be pragmatism. And where um, the um, where ultimately the focus for some aesthetics is going to be in the, the actual freaking doing of it. That, so like Schusterman's books, uh, he has this threefold um, uh, delineation and, um, and, and I'm gonna mess this up, uh, but between um, theory, doctrine, and practice. So uh, theory is gonna be um, like philosophy, uh, talking about the body in this place, the concept. Doctrines are going to be texts um, on bodily practices. So um, like Bushido Code, the Kama Sutra, um, things of, the, of that sort um, that aren't uh, philosophical, uh, conceptual exegesis, um, but um, just sort of uh, instructional texts on a certain level. And then uh, the third level of practice, uh, actually doing stuff. And basically, those first two levels are all well and good for Schusterman. And, and when we're talking, when we're doing philosophy, yeah, of course we work with texts. Um, but um, where ultimately um, it, it's all going to be subservient, like the, the theory is going to be in service of practice, not the other way around. Um, so the the emphasis with some aesthetics is not going to be so much on talking about the body and yeah the body shows up here in art and shows up there but it's going to be about the using of the body to the extent that we are t talking and doing some aesthetics to the extent that we are writing in, in some aesthetics it's going to be um descriptive and prescriptive with regard to the actual factual using of the body and not just noting where the body is present if that makes any sense i think that might have been a little bit rambly so please forgive is it okay if i just have like a, a quick follow-up okay. okay so it so if i'm understanding you right like unfortunately my internet sort of cut out like a tiny bit at the beginning but i'm gonna watch the recording for like the first three seconds of what you said but um like so using the body could you have some aesthetics uh, like a some aesthetics account for things like sand paintings and things that are like rituals that are like using the body in a specific way but it's like the body is not the like the mm -hmm. focal point of the like aesthetic encounter or however you want to say it well, well I think that it, it again it's going to be about 
um, the body as a site of fashioning rather than the body being used to fashion. Uh, that, that was the quote I was digging for from Schusterman and, and trying to dig out the cobwebs for. Um, I think it's on page, in the first three pages of body consciousness where uh, there's a fairly definitive statement that I was trying to dig up, um, uh, but that, that um, it's about um, the body, the soma, as um, the site for creative self-fashioning. Um, and so um, to the extent, uh, and it gets a little bit bit, bit if you hear, and I'm not like a, a master when it comes to like San, San Mandala uh, type art, but there is over and above the physical production of the mandala art, I would imagine that um, over the course of the days that one is doing this, that um, the engagement of the body, the, the stretching of one's muscles, and the, the and all, and the fine de dexterous work that that becomes the context, the the body itself becomes the context for a reflection on what's going on, um, and it, again, it's going to be about the body as a site for uh, reflection, re reflective self-fashioning or however uh, Schusterman puts it. So within artistic production, there's always going to be this side uh, where um, you, you, I mean, kind of looking at a phenomenology of the artist, like you, you um, ha so I, I play music, like uh, when I say I play music, I play like shitty white stripesy kind of uh, uh, latter day uh, Led Zeppelin-ish kind of whatnot. Um, sloppy uh, stoner guitar music, but uh, where you get these moments where you find yourself doing something, it gets away from you, and, and where like ho holy hell, I'm I'm doing that. Um, uh, uh, that's one mode, um, that, that that moment of wonder. Um, but where, yeah, on the one hand, you're uh, I might be making a, a musical object, so to speak, and that's an aesthetic concern. Uh, but a more narrowly soma aesthetic concern is going to be those moments of wonder, of revelation, of my body, my stupid hands and whatnot can do that. Um, and seeing the dimensions of what the body can, can do over and above the programmed in sensibility that we kind of slouch into, that's going to be more the focus of soma aesthetics, properly speaking, to the extent we, as philosophers, have to draw lines in the sand because Damn it, that's what we do. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Alexandra. Okay, uh, Paul has a question. Hi, yeah, this is um, as much a, really a call for clarification. Your, your work um, has seems to have two distinct pieces, you know, with the butler, the critical theory. You're, you're looking at the, the social constraints and the ways in which we're socialized in various ways, right? And this has been examined by, you know, Goffman and, F, you know, methodologist presentation of self in everyday life. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of insight to be gained there. And then there's this other piece and, you know, R Richard, you know, sometimes he writes about Bourdieu, sometimes he writes about some aesthetics, right? So the question simply put is how the pieces go together. Namely, what does soma aesthetics have to do with political liberation? How, or how do you draw the, the connecting line between whatever degree of freedom you find in improvisation at the level of bodily aesthetics or bodily movement and the, for, the social forces that dictate uh, conformity and constraint uh, in matters large and small? Um, yeah, you might discover, oh, I can work an interesting variation on guitar chord or a dance movement or something like that. And mm -hmm. this gives you a, a type of aesthetic freedom. How that translates or how that informs on the political level, uh, I'd like to hear more about. Well, the first thing I'd like to do is just to qualify um, that connection and to throw some cold water on the liberatory potential of some aesthetics with regard to, um, you know, uh, to, to uh, political configurations um, that, um, yeah, as, as, I, as I say with my Wizard of Oz bit at the end that 
when we're looking at subject life and we're looking at subjectivation, um, this is occurring from a thousand different points. There's a thousand encounters. There's a thousand hey yous, uh, hey professor, uh, hey man, hey woman, hey uh, all of the different ways we're hailed into existence, all the different ways we respond, all the the, the manifold of uh, of 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 scripts uh, that, we, that we follow that gives us some purchase in everyday life. And as I say, in that section, there's not likely, there, there, there really can't be a singular pull of the curtain back with some aesthetic practices. It's gonna take thousands of uh, curtain pulls and thousands of contexts to acquire that uh, you know, burgeoning uh, sense that this bodily life is on some level contingent. Now, what I want to, as far as the, the first part of this, that, with that qualification in mind, when we're talking about the political dimension of the body here, it's basically just um, starting with, um, well, it's a, it's a, a, a it, it's, it's a, um, you know, Butler has their own sort of flowery language about it. Uh, I find it somewhat intuitive just in terms of my own lived experience, but basically where, the body, um, not, not just the bare physical body uh, the, as a sort of biological entity, but the body that shows up in society and is subject to recognition um, and being subject to recognition is recognized as subject, uh, that um, the, the body um, that, that's installed, so to speak, is um, a skin tight prison that um that that the the body um that that we acquire in, in the course of all of these these encounters with you know, thousands of others uh that that um the um it it it, it, it is almost as though there's a um there, there's an epi epidermis of, of discourse covering everything. I know with my particular epidermis, there's a whole bunch of discourse always covering it in, in advance of me showing up on any, at, in any particular scene. Um, which is to say that um, I am necessary, to put it in racial terms as I seem to be uh, lapsing into, I am um, necessarily black that power structures on a macro level make me black with all of the pejorative connotations over and above, you know, simple biological uh, content, the, the set fact of melanin in my skin, that there's this epi epidermis, there's this epiphenomenon on top of the uh, phenomenon, the phenomenal skin, um, where um, it seems that there is this compelling necessity to always show up in this way. Um, and what I want to suggest, again, not as a silver bullet remedy to this, but um, what we get in fits and starts with, uh, with, with this kind of ritual, some aesthetic attention uh, to our bodily presence is that we get some imperfect dim insight into the fact that that epa epa uh, dermis, that epiphenomenon um, uh, the, 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 of discourse that, that, that's covering us, that skin tight prison, that that is itself made, that it's not so necessary as initially appears. Um, it's not um, a silver bullet, it's not a curative to everything, uh, but I'd rather have, um, I'd, I'd rather go into the struggles of the everyday with conscious awareness of the construction of, of all that and, 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 a, and a feeling that it could with considerable work be perhaps remade, a, a, a justified optimism. Let me just press one, one other way and really it's, it's just uh, asking you to sort of fill in or, or elaborate the, the underlying uh, vision, right? The, I was looking for a connection between the political and the personal because, right, you you 
seemed to frame the talk as a critique of Butler and this idea of that we're just left with rage at power structures. And the response is no, there's a way out through some aesthetics, we, we can discover an alternative way to be. But and this goes back, I think, to a point that Rob, I heard Robbie trying to press. So that <clears throat> there's supposed to be something liberating here, right? You, you keep using the term natural as if, right, this, this is going to help leverage us in a, in a different way to, to move us beyond the rage or, or, or the constraints. And I, I'm just not seeing how the dots connect. I, I, I grant you, I want to grant you everything you said about stone aesthetics. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is how that connects up in some interesting and substantive way to political liberation or to getting us back to a better state. Well, here, I'll give you a short example. This is my example. This is just me parroting Schusterman. Um, so with many some aesthetic disciplines, breath awareness is a major concern. Focus on your breathing, you know, uh, whether we're talking meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, uh, various martial arts approaches, the breath is a big deal, right? And we have rhythm there um, as far as like sort of birth, first rhythms that we might have cued into aesthetically. Um, Schusterman contends, and I tend to go along with this, whether or not you lend credence to it, you know, uh, your mileage may vary with this, but um, I think it's plausible where you can imagine um, in devoting ourselves to a, a given ritual practice um, with an emphasis on breath, that we, uh, we might in our everyday um, uh, interactions out in the world and outside of the, um, the the dojo or outside of the meditation center or whatever it is that uh, we might in our interactions with people become aware of our um, uh, of the quickening of our breath and agitation when we deal with uh, people that we find distasteful uh, that we he basically gives the example of a breath awareness and properly channeled cluing us into our prejudices that noticing that I'm I'm uh, give, having a, a sense of one's uh, anxiety manifesting on a bodily level, being aware of, of the kind of, uh, of uh, bodily indicators that we have when, when we're perhaps dealing with people that we don't like, maybe people that we've been taught not to like, um, that this, that the body, uh, with, uh, when we're properly aware of, us, of it, this can give us clues as to our own actions and our own uh, and, and to what might have previously seemed to be a sort of necessary component of our of our action uh, that it can be revised so that's schusterman's example not necessarily mine but it's one that i tend to subscribe to as at least being plausible a plausible account of how some aesthetic awareness Again, it's not an a -lead. This isn't about some aesthetic. Doing yoga means that you're going to affect the revolution tomorrow. I'm not saying anything like that, but um, that again, in fits and starts, getting just a clue in to the lack of necessity uh, behind our everyday walk and talk. I think is incredibly politically valuable. Teleologically, I mean, not leading to an end politically but still a value. Um, I've got a question if no one else has one right now. <laughs> um, so, uh, trying to put this into a good question form here, <laughs> but, I guess um, the, the sense that the rituals of everyday life um, are powerful and necessary and, um, and that somehow uh, 
modern life has has made them seem more so. I'm not sure if that's part. I think that's part of Foucault's point anyway. Uh, um, there seems to be something right about it, but on the other hand, um, in a different mood, I have a feeling that all the rituals of our everyday life and all traditional rituals are very on a very tenuous basis that 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 they're at risk um, um, so I, yeah i wonder if you can say anything about that tension and about how you know how the things you're talking about might look from that other point of view if i mean if you think that other point of view is worth talking about so yeah it's, it's a little bit nebulous a set of concerns here but i i think i share uh share this um certainly when uh just thinking about foucault here i'm just i'm just thinking back to discipline and punish where um it, it's it, 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 when we're looking at, at power as he conceives it, it it has this um you know, pre-industrial and post-industrial phases. And, and he has this very explicit treatment of ritual um, in the pre-industrial phase as um, being uh, um, the way that ritual is tied with memory and commemoration. So that, that um, the historical memory was, um, uh, and where this was preserved through ritual, uh, this was the uh, province of a very few in pre-industrial uh, uh, age society, that, that royals were commemorated and um, and, um, and, um, and, and where there were, uh, where, where there was a, a, a large amount of energy, uh, spent codifying, uh, the, the rituals of behavior, um, at, at the top and then pretty much everybody else is left alone. Whereas in the modern age that, um, is looking to extract maximum value from each worker assembly line style that you get this prescription. Of, of everybody in a ritual matrix uh, moving forward. Um, and one of the, it's a curious statement, I, and I, if, if I were more technically adept right now and also able to, to think, um, and if my mind weren't jelly, uh, there's this bit from Foucault, it's, it's kind of this weird little bit of irony where he almost laments um, this state of affairs where something has been lost, um, the, 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 char the character of ritual has been kind of denuded in the industrial age of the aesthetic side of it that, that um, accompanied the commemoration of uh, uh, rituals, just sort of more the, the province of the elite few. Um, and just kind of ripping off of that, and I'm not sure if this will be a satisfactory answer to you, but one thing that I've, I've been thinking about that this present somewhat in Lisa Ho's own work is um, the talk of sedimentation of like a given sort of ritual arrangement of society and um the idea of a tempo to this if we look at ritual as a technology um that ritual perhaps has uh that, that, that if, uh, if we look at um the sort of nexus between uh, human and nature the, of the, all our ritual patterns that um there's been a quickening of how the strata um, um, cover themselves up over time, that, uh, especially the internet, uh, um, I, I think seems to be accelerating this, where um, the rituals of online life, even 10 or 20 years ago, seem uh, like um, um, opaque, like how the hell did we get from there to here? Um, and just in, in online life, um, let alone uh, other dimensions. Um, I think that there's room for a, um, a a work and I've kind of like sketches out on the back of a napkin. It's not like a real thought so far, but basically uh, the question concerning ritual technology. Um, I think that there's um, work to be done there and looking at very broadly speaking, um, the force of ritual practices um, be, being made sort of, uh, well, ritual practices being made uh, anesthetic and increasingly technocratic um, over time. And maybe that feeling of loss uh, that, that I think I, I was detecting in, in your remark there, uh, Professor Stone, I, I think that it might be accountable on that level. What to do with that account, I'm not quite sure. But um, yeah, I basically am saying, 
yeah, I agree with it as a worry. And I have some initial suspicions to, as to how to talk about it within this framework, what to do with that mess. Yeah, got me. So you're, so you're saying that um, when I say it feels like rituals are, are, are at risk, uh, like, you know, we're barely hanging on to them or something like that. What I mean is... Well, part of it is that ritual requires repetition just on a conceptual level that, um, it, it, and it's difficult like saying like where one sort of ritual scheme ends and one begins with this talk of segmentation. But basically, um, I, I think it would be fair to say if we're looking at sort of the life cycle of rituals from like, you know, a cave man, cave, a cave person kind of age through you know, pre-industrial, mercantilist industrial industrial post-industrial um internet post-internet sort of phase that um it is um that that things aren't being repeated for as long that the the shelf life of a, a sort of a, of patterns um of, of interaction these patterns of interaction called rituals that uh, these don't see repetition is still present in order for them to be rituals it's not just one-off behavior but um, for Lee, this is where Kant comes in a little bit. He talks about ritual as uh, the sort of ritual edifice as a material object upon which um, uh, um, labor can be performed. Um, and where um, there's not going to be, um, oh, hi, Kat. Um, there's not going to be, um, <laughs> the same or consistent object um, for labor, uh, for artistic labor to take, uh, um, to, to, um, to, um, uh, to, to work against. Um, and so um, I think this feeling of loss of disconnection with ritual, I think this has to do with the way in which uh, the time frame of rituals are becoming increasingly isolated and atomic and I think that that's a way of talking about this sort of increasing anesthetic um, nature of, of ritual, where it might not, where, where perhaps the, the small L, not silver bullet, liberatory poten potential of ritual is being increasingly threatened and needs to be actively preserved uh, with attention to sort of slow time with ritual. That yeah okay that that's that's a lot to think about thank you Sorry, that's just off, off the cuff uh, I don't <laughs> that's no no it's good so um and I think uh, we also are at our time limit now so um, uh, let's thank our speaker again and uh, well, thank you all I really enjoyed that I hope you know I'll def I definitely want to look at your book <laughs> when it comes out great sales <laughs> pitch succeeded okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Nice.